Chapter 17 A Perfect Pandemonium With its princes of the lofty wire, the Brooklyn Bridge is now the cheapest, the most entertaining, and the best attended circus in the world. New York Tribune They all stood waiting for the river to clear. Martin and McNulty under the arches on the New York Tower, Barrington and a carpenter named Brown out on a hoisting frame at the top of the tower, where they could signal to the engine man in the yard. Foreman Dempsey and several workmen close by on the tower itself, and on the wharves below and across the river, in the rigging of ships tied up on both shores, perhaps six thousand spectators, many of whom had been waiting for several hours. The idea at first had been to take the rope across on a Sunday or at night, when there would be little traffic on the water. On the average day, as many as a hundred craft passed the line of the bridge in an hour's time. But Farrington had noted that frequently there would be clear water between the towers for stretches of four to eight minutes, even on the busiest days of the week, so the decision had been to go ahead just as soon as everything was ready. A few days earlier, the ends of two working ropes had been hauled up and over the top of the Brooklyn Tower. Made of twisted chrome steel strands, these ropes were three-quarters of an inch in diameter, more than three thousand feet long, and were wound on a big wooden drum set at the base of the tower on the river side. To get the ropes over the top had been relatively simple. A heavy hemp rope had been put over first, then tied to the eyelet at the end of the wire rope. That done, the hoisting engine in the yard was started up. The wire rope was pulled up to the top, where it passed through a set of pulleys, then down the other side. From the yard the ropes were then hauled inland to the summit of the Brooklyn anchorage in much the same way except that fenders and trestles had to be erected, and men stationed at all intervening housetops to prevent any accidental damage. At the anchorage, the two wire ropes were joined and passed around several oak wheels, the main one of which, the driving wheel as it was called, was mounted horizontally in a massive timber framework and was a good twelve feet in diameter. Back at the base of the tower, one of the reels was then put on board a stone scow and hung on a wooden axle so when the scow started for New York, the rope would be unwound by the strain from the Brooklyn shore, where the rope was temporarily lashed tight. By nine that morning, Monday the 14th, everything was in order. Huge American flags had been raised on top of both towers, and there was much excitement among the spectators. Slack water, the relatively calm interval between tides, would occur in the next hour. Martin, McNulty, and Farrington had gone on board the scow to supervise things, along with the white-bearded O. P. Quintard and two or three young ladies, the identities of whom were never given in later accounts. Shortly past nine, two steam tugs pulled alongside. One made fast to the starboard side of the scow, the other stood off slightly, ready to keep other craft at a distance during the trip across. At nine-thirty the tugs sounded their bells, Moorings were cast off, tugs and scow swung slowly out into the river. At the stern of the scow the wire rope trailed off into the water. The tide was still running out, and as the boats pulled away the current carried them downstream some, but not enough to matter. Slowly, steadily, they pushed for the opposite shore, the rope paying out and sinking to the bottom as fast as it unwound. Two-thirds of the way across the tugs had to stop to allow an English bark to pass up river across their bows. She came so close, wrote a reporter on the lead tug, that a pebble could have been tossed upon her deck with the most perfect ease. But that had been the single interruption. The whole trip took less than ten minutes, and the arrival at the New York Tower had been greeted by loud applause. The scow made fast in a very businesslike fashion. The balance of the rope was unwound and laid on the dock. The next thing had been to get the rope over the New York Tower. A hemp rope had been passed over the tower previously and was now attached to the end of the wire. But nothing more was done until Farrington had climbed to the top of the tower to make a few final checks. At ten-twenty he signaled from above. The hoisting engine was thrown into gear and in a matter of minutes the wire was over the top and reeled part way onto the yard engine's big drum. The main body of the rope, however, still lay at the bottom of the river, and there it remained as everyone stood watching for a moment with no boats in the way, or none about to be, when it could be pulled out of the water. The waiting seemed interminable. Half an hour went by, three-quarters of an hour, and still there was no break in the traffic. 
two barges and an excursion steamer moving out into the stream from Jewel Stock took forever getting underway. The excursion boat was bound for Oriental Grove on the Sound with a picnic party, and everyone on board appeared delighted by the grandstand view of the doings at the bridge. At about half-past ten, as a precautionary warning to passing ships, a little howitzer had been fired at the foot of the New York Tower, but that seemed to have no effect. It began to look, in fact, as though several hours would pass before the river would be clear enough to get on with the work. But as some of the subsequent newspaper accounts noted, the long wait did nothing to dampen anyone's spirits, and the delay added considerably to the size of the crowd. Then the break came. The river was perfectly empty from tower to tower. At twenty-five past eleven, from the archway on the New York Tower, Martin shouted up to Farrington, Go ahead! Farrington had Brown signal to the hoisting engine. The cannon was fired a second time, to signal the men on the Brooklyn side to cut loose their lashings and as a warning to approaching ships. In a few seconds the rope began to move, Farrington wrote later. There was a ripple around it in the water. It began to draw away from the dock toward Brooklyn, and soon we could see the other part coming from Brooklyn towards us. Faster and faster the space of clear water between the two parts narrowed, and in four minutes from the time of starting it swung clear of the surface of the water with a sparkling swish amid the cheers of spectators on the wharves and ferry boats and the shouts of our own workmen. This time the drum in the yard was wound by a thirty-horsepower engine that made one hundred fifty revolutions per minute. The engine used to pull the wire over the tower had been only half as powerful. As a result, it took just two and a half minutes to pull the wire free from the water, and five minutes, all told, to get it into proper position for the time being, stretched from tower to tower at an elevation above the water of two hundred feet, more or less. Almost immediately a boat passed by below, a lighter called Comet carrying a load of pig iron, and at least one reporter took the opportunity to go up on the Brooklyn Tower to take a look at the view. When it is considered that one has to climb upward of thirty flights of winding stairway, the toil of the ascent on a close August day can be readily imagined, wrote the young man from the Herald. But all this is instantly forgotten when the picture from the summit spreads out at one's feet. The buildings of both cities, he said, looked dwarfed beneath the overtopping height of the tower. The streets seemed narrowed down to lanes in Brooklyn and to mere pathways in New York. The view of the river and the bay, with their islands and with tiny ships moving restlessly this way and that, all looked extremely fine, he said. What a splendid set of photographs could be obtained from this point. Doubtless some enterprising photographer will seize the chance. At least one photographer had already been to the top of the Brooklyn Tower, J. H. Beals, who earlier in the year had made the first great panoramic photograph of Lower Manhattan, from the Battery to Rutgers Street, by taking five different views that he later spliced together into one panorama more than seven feet long. With the first half of the working rope thus in place, the drum and hoisting engine in the New York yard had to be freed to haul over the second half. So a huge iron clamp was bolted to the end, near the engine house, about ten feet from the ground. A pulley block was made fast to the wharf close to the drum, another to the clamp, and a rope passed between them several times made a lashing strong enough to withstand the pull of the wire rope, the end of which was immediately cast loose from the drum. The tugs and the scow, in the meantime, had returned to the Brooklyn Tower, and about noon they started back with the second rope. By half-past three it, too, had been hoisted out of the river, everything going even more smoothly than the first time. The next step would be to take the ends of the two ropes back to the New York anchorage, splice them, and thereby form one immense loop, or endless traveler, over the towers, reaching all the way from anchorage to anchorage. The entire length of the traveler, when completed, would be 6,800 feet, or considerably more than a mile, making it easily the longest belt connecting machinery anywhere on earth. Wedded was the one-word headline in the evening edition of the Eagle. The thing is done, the article began. New York and Brooklyn had been joined at last. But no New York paper was willing to go quite that far. The Herald, for example, described the great endless rope draped over the river as only the engagement ring in the marriage preparations of the two cities. All the same, the event was an enormous popular success, and talk of the bridge was everywhere as the papers reported that the next step would be to send a man across on the rope. 
More than a hundred people appeared at the bridge offices to apply for the job, including a twelve-year-old boy who wanted to go hand over hand, and a Long Island acrobat who considered it a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Nearly all of them volunteered to make the trip without pay, and C.C. C. Martin told reporters there were at least a dozen of his own men who would give a month's wages to be the first one to cross the river. To quiet things down some, it was announced that the man picked to make the trip would be one of the most trusted employees and probably one of the engineers. The rope would first be run back and forth a number of times, then the man would go over in a bosun's chair, a seat and a sling made fast to the rope. He would start from the Brooklyn anchorage, the announcement said. Henry Murphy wanted the historic journey to originate in Brooklyn. He would ride up to the tower, climb out, cross over to the other edge, get back in his seat and start across the river. The object of this journey will be to see how the thing works. All the machinery for running the rope was at the Brooklyn anchorage. At the foot of the great stone mass stood a 30-horsepower steam hoisting engine that would drive the wheels. It was completely enclosed, as was its boiler nearby. Up above, across the face of the anchorage, secured just over the arches, was a line of shafting with several pulleys. A 16-inch wide belt, 90 feet long, connected the pulleys on the shafting with the gears and cogwheels that turned the enormous 12-foot wheel that carried the working rope. The arrangement of cogwheels was such that the direction of the rope could be reversed without reversing the engine, an important feature since the rope was not to be revolved continuously but worked back and forth. On the New York anchorage, the framework of the main pulley was adjustable so it could be moved forward or back in order to give the rope the prescribed deflection or sag. At one deflection, the rope would bear greater weight than at another, and thus adjusting the deflection just so would be a vital part of the work to come. Had there not been some trouble with the delivery of one or two essential belts, the much-heralded first crossing would have taken place almost immediately after the traveler was in place, but there were numerous other matters to attend to in any event, and the eagle, ever the ardent champion of the bridge, wrote, It is refreshing to see how the work is pushed forward, and yet the thoroughness with which everything is done in these days of slighted work and ill-performed operations. To the surprise of almost no one who had had anything to do with building the bridge, the man chosen to make the first trip over the river was Master Mechanic E. F. Farrington. Farrington, who would so soon become a subject of great public interest, was nearing sixty in 1876, but still agile, tough, and, of course, exceedingly knowledgeable about working with wire rope. Subsequent newspaper articles would reveal also that he came from Massachusetts originally, where he had been put to work in a woolen mill at age nine, that he had been a farmer, a carpenter, a machinist in England, a seaman, a gasworks superintendent, and was considered the best bridge mechanic in the country. On the morning of Friday, August 25th, when he arrived at the Brooklyn Anchorage ready to make his historic journey, he appeared perfectly cool and collected. A spare man of medium height, with gray beard and blue eyes, turned out quite formally for the occasion in a fresh suit of unbleached linen and a new straw hat. An announcement that a man was to make the crossing that day had been published in the Eagle the previous afternoon. As a result, the crowds had begun gathering since well before nine in the morning. Seen from Brooklyn, the piers adjacent to the New York Tower looked black with people, and the gates to the Brooklyn Anchorage and Tower Yard were jammed with spectators. Up on the anchorage itself, workmen were busy adjusting belts and pulleys, with Martin, McNulty, and Farrington supervising everything. By eleven, all looked in order. The machinery was set in motion, and the rope began moving across the river. To get every twist and kink out, it had to be worked back and forth several times. Otherwise, anything attached to it, including a human passenger, would have been turned over and over. A stick tied to the rope as a marker and sent from the Brooklyn anchorage up to the Brooklyn Tower twisted completely around several times while making its slow ascent. But after half an hour of working the rope to and fro, it moved along perfectly. There was a break for the noon meal. The day was bright and very hot by then. Up on the Brooklyn Tower, a small crowd of privileged spectators had gathered, including Senator Murphy and several ladies. The sun beat down on the exposed stonework, and at one point some of the reporters in the group sent a note over the rope to their compatriots on the opposite tower, asking for cold beer and sandwiches. An answer was returned by the same route. Send the money and we will send the beer. But no money was sent. Presently, about twenty past one, the huge American flag was again unfurled from the Brooklyn Tower, 
and minutes later another went up the flagstaff on the New York Tower. Then two men with red signal flags were seen to wave to each other from the tops of either tower. Everything was set to go. Estimates were that more than 10,000 people were watching. Farrington, all this time, had been supervising the preparation of his bosun's chair. A simple board seat, two feet long and two inches thick, with rope holes drilled in each corner, like an ordinary swing, and with four ropes drawn through and tied to the wire rope just as they might be for a swing. The board itself had been placed so that only one end rested on the rim of the anchorage, while most of it hung out over the edge, eighty feet above the street. So when Farrington proceeded to take his seat, it was, in the words of one bystander, a somewhat delicate operation. The men assisting him next passed a rope across his back, to form a rest of sorts, then brought it around across his chest and tied it securely to one of the corner ropes. All these precautions, however, appeared to make the daring voyager feel only more uncomfortable. At thirty-two minutes past one o'clock, Farrington said he was ready. Timothy McCarthy ran the engine, Farrington would write later, and John D. Smallfield handled the starting lever most carefully, according to a system of signals previously agreed upon. Martin, who was standing close by, dipped a signal flag. John D. Smallfield in the yard below shifted his lever, and in an instant the master mechanic was on his way. There was great shouting from down below, and up ahead, on top of the tower, people were waving hats and handkerchiefs. Then all at once, as he went swinging out over the housetops between the anchorage and the tower, Farrington freed himself from the rope about his chest and stood up on the seat. Holding on first with one hand, then the other, he lifted his hat in response to the continuing ovation. Then he sat down again. People were running through the streets beneath him now, shouting and cheering as they ran. He waved, he blew them kisses. Sailing steadily along all the while, his course was nearly horizontal at first, like that of a heavy bird taking flight because of the sag in the rope. His light coat blew open and began fluttering in the wind. And then he was beyond the sag and climbing sharply, almost straight up, a coat-flapping, gently twirling form that looked very small, fragile, and very bird-like now against the granite face of the tower. The rope had to be operated with the greatest care at this stage as Farrington neared the top of the tower, for if he were drawn suddenly against the coping he might be knocked right out of his seat. A reporter described the moment this way. One of the most experienced engineers in the place held the lever, McNulty most likely, and as Mr. Farrington was seen to approach the top of the tower, the engine was slowed. All eyes were now strained to discern the movements of the voyager. That he appreciated the danger was evident, as was also the reason for freeing himself from the restraints of the encircling rope, for he stood upright again with his feet upon the board and his hands ready to save himself by grasping the coping of the tower in case the wire was not stopped in time. The red flag was seen to drop, and simultaneously the wire was stopped. Two men stood by ready to help Mr. Farrington upon the tower, but he was still a little too low down to be reached. Red flag was held aloft, and the engineer, interpreting that signal to mean go ahead, started the engine again very cautiously. It had moved but a few feet when the flag dropped again, and the engine was stopped instantaneously. Mr. Farrington was now nearly level with the top of the tower, and strong hands grasping his, he was upon his feet and surrounded by an excited crowd of friends in a second. A tremendous cheer went up from the streets and rooftops, followed quickly by a salute from the little cannon across the river. His time from anchorage to tower was three and three-quarter minutes. Quite a number of those gentlemen with privileged vantage points on the towers and anchorages had their watches out through the whole of Farrington's aerial journey, and the time he took from point to point would be a subject of the greatest interest among them, and duly noted for the historical record. Farrington told those clustered about him on the Brooklyn Tower that the trip thus far had been nothing at all. Murphy shook him heartily by the hand and asked how he felt. It was an exhilarating moment for the senator. Farrington said he felt just fine. The little sling seat was then carried across to the opposite rim, and Farrington climbed down and seated himself once again for the long ride over the river. The rope he was traveling on did not look very big, even up close. It was about as thick as a man's thumb. But to those who stood with him at the tower's edge, the rope appeared to trail off to no more than a thread then to vanish altogether somewhere out beyond the middle of the river. 
It was all very well to know its tensile strength and the rest. It could carry the weight of ten men and more. Every instinct was still to pull back and shudder at the prospect of stepping off into such a void. Again the signal flag waved and the rope started, and the minute he swung away from the tower there was another outburst of cheering. This time all those crowded along the wharves were joined by thousands more on board the innumerable boats and ferries that had gathered for the occasion. All normal traffic on the river had stopped. From the towers it looked almost as though one could walk across just by stepping from boat to boat. Barrington went sailing over the river, waving, lifting his hat, very obviously having a glorious time, but he stayed seated. Then a steam tug directly beneath him let loose with its shrill whistle. Instantly a dozen others joined in. In seconds every boat on the river was sounding its approval as the tiny figure of a man went soaring overhead, to all appearances self-propelled, spinning around every now and then, the rope he dangled from all but invisible against the sky. As he passed the center of the river and began his ascent to the New York Tower, the reception from shore was louder even than his Brooklyn send-off had been. And a little less than seven minutes after leaving the Brooklyn Tower, he made a flawless landing on top of the New York Tower. Then, with no delay whatever, he was across the summit of the tower, back in his seat again, and on his way on the last leg of the trip, down to the New York anchorage. Now the great mass of spectators along the riverfront surged inland toward the anchorage. Church bells were ringing, factory whistles screaming, along with all the boat horns, bells, and whistles that were still sounding forth from the water. A perfect pandemonium, the Times called it. Indeed, Master Mechanic Farrington seemed the only one not carried away by the moment. It was as though he might be having second thoughts about the commotion he was causing, or that he was sorry the ride was over. Despite the shouting and confusion that went on beneath him, wrote one onlooker, he sat quiet with his hands folded, save when he waved them in response, and showed every sign of perfect self-possession. Then Farrington stepped lightly onto the New York anchorage, the first passenger to cross over from Brooklyn by way of the Great Bridge. The entire trip had taken twenty-two minutes. After that, when Farrington climbed down from the anchorage, something close to a riot broke out. The crowd wanted to carry him through the streets in triumph. At first he had tried to make his way through, thinking naively that he could walk over to the ferry back to Brooklyn, but people were pressing about him so, reaching out to touch him with such fervor that he was obliged to seek refuge from their attentions in an office in the bridge yard. The hope was that things might settle down if he kept out of sight but an hour later the crowds had grown greater, if anything. A rowboat was brought to the wharf under the tower. Farrington slipped out a back door and was rowed to the other side. Farrington declared afterward, The ride gave me a magnificent view and such pleasing sensations as probably I shall never experience again. But he thought much too much fuss had been made over the episode, and told Roebling he was quite put out by the publicity he had received. He had had a natural desire to be the first man over, he said, but his real objective had been to demonstrate to his workmen, who would be doing the same thing under more hazardous conditions, his own complete confidence in the safety of the rope. He would ask no man to do anything he would not do himself. Moreover, he allowed that he and the assistant engineers had been getting too much praise lately. Roebling was the hardest worker of them all, he told one reporter. He does most of the brain work, Farrington said. Be that as it may, Farrington had done something neither Roebling nor anyone else had. In the eyes of the public, for the very first time, he had transformed years of talk and expense and several million tons of granite into a bridge over the East River. He had shown the thing could work, and like it or not, he himself had been transformed by the act. He said he had simply gone along for the ride. Anyone could have done it, was what he told people, the only thing necessary was to sit there, all of which was perfectly true to a very large extent. But the more he went on that way, deprecating his own part in the spectacle, the more he seemed to be saying something else, that this bridge was a more miraculous affair than one might imagine. It had not only taken him over the river with perfect safety, it had transformed him into a hero. And, of course, the fact that he was a plain mechanic, but a man of natural good sense and courage, did nothing to diminish his popular appeal. His crossing very simply had been a public triumph, as Harper's Monthly said. Nobody who saw it would ever forget it. He could say whatever he liked. The work to be done now 
briefly stated, was this. Two more three-quarter-inch wire ropes would have to be taken across and spliced to form a second endless traveler. Then a heavier rope, called the carrier, would follow, this one to hold the weight of several still heavier ropes to be hauled over. These would be the two-and-a-quarter-inch ropes to hold the light frame platforms or cradles upon which the men would stand when binding the wires for the great cables. Then supporting ropes for the footbridge would have to be laid up, the footbridge built, ropes for handrails strung, and two storm cables attached from tower to tower beneath the footbridge in inverted arcs to keep the footbridge from being carried off by the wind. All that accomplished, the real work of spinning the cables could begin, and it would be then that the travelers would perform their vital role. Work on the second traveler rope began the very next day, a Saturday. But this time, the rope was hauled over by the first traveler, rather than going by water, and before the day was over, bystanders along the riverfront were treated to still one more memorable, but entirely unexpected, high-wire performance. At eight that morning, first thing, a big reel of wire had been rolled into position on top of the Brooklyn anchorage. One end was lashed to the traveler. The traveler was started up. Slowly the reel unwound, and the new rope started toward the Brooklyn tower, seeming to creep out over the other rope, but really moving with it. When about fifty feet had run out, signal flags waved, the traveler was stopped momentarily, the two ropes were lashed together with heavy twine by men stationed next to the reel to keep the new rope from sagging, and then the rope was started up again. After that, similar lashings were made every fifty feet. As the new rope crept out over the housetops, the news spread through the whole neighborhood and across the river by ferry in advance of the rope. In no time, the streets and wharves were once more jammed with spectators. Once the rope had crossed the river, passed over the New York Tower and reached the anchorage beyond, it was secured at each end in a sort of monster vice. But then the lashings had to be cut loose from end to end, and the one way to do that was by hand. Accordingly, after the noontime break, two riggers began swinging themselves simultaneously from each tower down the land spans toward the two anchorages. From the New York Tower came a former sailor with the appropriate name of Harry Supple, who had been working on the bridge for six years and had been among those injured when the derricks fell. He used a bosun's chair like the one Farrington had crossed on, which was hung to the traveler by a big iron shackle. Seating himself as Farrington had, only without any restraining ropes about his chest, Supple took two and a half hitches around the traveler with a short length of rope that he would use to check his speed on the way down. Then he pushed off into midair, kicked his feet to get the shackle started, and with sudden speed slid down to the first lashing, where he pulled hard on his rope and stopped. A few fast slashes with a sheath knife, and he had the knot severed. Instantly, bits of twine flew into the air, and the wire ropes sprang apart with a terrific force, causing the new one to drop down in a big loop, and the old one, which Supple was riding on, to vibrate violently along its whole length. Supple himself was seen to drop six feet in his frail-looking seat and bounce about wildly, but he appeared not in the least bothered by that and immediately cast off his gauntlet, as the stay rope was called, and continued on. He sliced open the next lashing, the next and the next, proceeding with incredible speed, a noisy crowd urging him on all the way to the bottom. To separate the two ropes from tower to anchorage, a distance of one thousand feet bound by twenty lashings, took him ten minutes. When his feet landed on the anchorage, the ovation was such that he ought to have taken a long bow. In the meantime, however, spectators in Brooklyn had not fared so well. The other rigger, a German named William Corner, had been terribly nervous before stepping off from the tower, and once underway he had been both awkward and maddeningly cautious. He held on to the wire rope with both hands, letting himself down ever so slowly and only short distances at a time. He took so long with each knot that there was some speculation on top of the tower as to whether he might finish the job that week. As it was, he took nearly an hour to do the same thing Supple had done in ten minutes. So when the time came to start on the main span, Patrick Timms, the man picked to leave from the Brooklyn Tower, was told by the others in no uncertain terms to do better by them. The plan was for Timms and Thomas Carroll to slide down from the two towers and meet in the middle over the river cutting the lashings in just the way the other two had. That done, they were to hitch themselves to the traveler, which would then be entirely free, 
and be hauled back up to the Brooklyn Tower. Timms and Carroll were both Englishmen. Timms was lithe and powerfully built. Carroll, a huge portly man, would be testing the wire, it was said, with well over two hundred pounds. Timms had come darting down his side at a great cliff, recovering for Brooklyn whatever glory had been lost by the awkward corner. But Carroll had run into trouble almost right away. For some reason, probably to gain speed going down the rope, Carroll had hung his seat by a pulley instead of the iron shackle used by the others. The pulley had worked fine at first. He shot away from the tower faster than any of them. But as he approached the second lashing, the pulley jammed between the two traveler ropes, and try as he would, he was unable to budget loose or to reach far enough ahead to get at the next lashing. It was at this point that young Supple, who by now had returned to the top of the New York Tower, decided to go to the rescue. He swung himself out over the river sailor-style, hand over hand, with his legs wrapped around the traveler rope. He reached Carroll quickly enough, passed him by, and cut the next lashing, which instantly freed the pulley. Then back he went up to the tower in the same way he had come down, and carrying on an easy conversation with those on the tower all the while. The crowd below was ecstatic. Carroll, meanwhile, slid on only to get caught the same as before again and again, and freeing himself only after the greatest effort. His progress was so slow, in fact, that he was no more than halfway down his side of the rope when Timms, having passed the center of the sag, had started to haul himself by hand up the steep incline toward Carroll, cutting the lashings as he went. Once they met and all the lashings were free, there was a new problem. The traveler would not move. Somehow the two ropes had gotten twisted around each other, with the result that it was impossible to haul the men in. So something had to be improvised. A ring was put over the traveler, and a heavy weight and one end of a hemp rope were attached to it. The weight, it was hoped, would be enough to carry the ring and the rope down from the New York Tower to the stranded pair, who were perhaps four hundred feet distant. But the ring slid only a quarter of the distance, then stopped for good. Once more Harry Supple went into action. Fixing a loop in the same hemp rope, he strapped it about one leg and worked his way out toward Timms and Carroll, both of whom, to the amazement of everyone, seemed quite nonchalant about the whole business. Timms, swinging in his perch, his arms resting on the upper wire, looked as though he might be about to fall asleep. Supple reached them with no trouble, tied the end of the rope he carried to Carroll's chair, climbed onto the chair with Carroll, and the two of them were pulled back to the tower, leaving Timms hanging out there by himself. The traveler was tried again then, and this time it worked. Timms began moving along back toward Brooklyn, whence he came, swinging his legs, as though on a joy ride, looking all about up and down the river. But before he was a third of the way to Brooklyn, there was a sudden frightful jerk in the wire, as though something had snapped, and it was noted by those watching through glasses that Timms suddenly changed his expression. A belt on the engine had broken, and it took twenty minutes to fix it, which were twenty minutes during which Timms had no way of knowing what the trouble was. Gradually regaining his composure, he just sat very still, watching the boats below and waving his hand in answer to cheers from passengers gazing up from passing ferries. Presently he was pulled to the tower, and the rest of the day was devoted to getting the new rope into proper position. The papers made much of all this. Even the world, which had seldom ever had a good word for the bridge, ran a long account, calling it in a big headline a stupendous tightrope performance. And later, in a formal report to the chief engineer, Payne would write, Mr. Harry Supple was all that could be desired as foreman of riggers. When another rope was taken over on Monday, the second half of the new traveler, the crowds were there again and the event was treated by the press as a major theatrical opening might be, or a new circus in town. People knew more what to expect this time. And this time the new men being given a chance at the work were out to break Harry Supple's record of one thousand feet in ten minutes which one of them, William Miller, managed to do, going the same route Supple had from the New York Tower to the New York Anchorage in seven and a half minutes. As he neared the Anchorage, wrote a reporter, the order was given, Stand by men to snatch him. His face was firmly set, and his eyes had a queer light in them, his face shining with the galvanized iron dust that the iron shackle of his chair had ground from the wires, and his hands were in active use on the rope. When he came within reach, the men caught him, and with a rousing cheer landed him on the stonework. Two others, Frederick Arnold and James O'Neill, had also by now taken off from the towers and could be seen plummeting pell-mell down the extreme ends of the main span over the river. 
O'Neill, the man from the New York Tower, appeared to be making the best time, but then he stopped abruptly as though his chair had jammed the way Carol's had. But when the engineers, Martin McNulty, Payne, turned their glasses on him, they saw he was getting out of his chair and climbing up onto the wire above. Next thing he slung himself by a strap, his belt apparently, to the wire he had not been riding on, and it was then that everyone on the tower realized what had happened. Some way or other the two ropes had crossed, and O'Neill had jumped off from the tower with his chair slung to the wrong one, to the new rope rather than to the traveler. O'Neill had discovered this in time, obviously, and with great nerve decided to make the change immediately. Sitting there on the traveler, a good 185 feet over the river, he cut his chair clear from the shackle and tied the chair ropes to the proper wire. It took him about fifteen minutes to make the switch, the hearts of many spectators beating fast and hard on witnessing his cool daring. O'Neill had moved on again eventually and reached the middle of the river, where Arnold, meantime, had been sitting waiting patiently. Then, after dangling out there for a time, the two of them were towed back to the New York Tower. But the greatest excitement of the day had occurred a little earlier over on the Brooklyn side, where the descent from tower to anchorage was made by none other than E. F. Farrington, who apparently wanted to make up for Corner's poor showing on Saturday and to demonstrate to his men, and just possibly to the Brooklyn spectators as well, how the job ought to be handled. On the Brooklyn side also, quite a number of people had been admitted within the enclosure surrounding the tower yard, and among them were several seemingly fearless young women, who wanted the best possible view of the high-wire performers, and of the fatherly Farrington in particular. One pretty brunette in a pink summer dress, a girl of about eighteen, led the way. Followed by the others, she had climbed to the top of the tower, and there, with a pair of opera glasses, waiting for the master mechanic to make his appearance, she was seen to study the vast panorama spread out below. Farrington, it was understood, would commence his descent at two o'clock, and at two o'clock he appeared, dressed like a doctor this time, in suit and tie and a white linen duster and carrying a large knife. He took his seat, stepped off, and was on his way with no to-do. And he was making swift progress with all the dispatch of a surgeon when quite by accident he dropped his knife. It fell some two hundred feet, harming nobody, but it also left Farrington in a rather impossible predicament, or so it would seem from the ground. Farrington, however, proceeded right along as though nothing had happened. When he reached the next lashing, he simply went at it with his hands, and to the delight of everyone had it untied in a matter of seconds. Though it took him quite a little while to get down, the crowd stayed with him the whole time, and he still managed to do the job faster than had poor corner. And then the circus acts were over. Both travelers were in position, ready for business, mounted in such a way that the space between the sides of each enormous loop was about twenty-seven feet, or so wide apart that when they were seen from the waterfront or from out on the river, it looked as though four separate ropes had been strung over the towers, placed about where the four great cables were to hang. I have carried out your instructions to the letter, Farrington wrote to Roebling, and from my perfect familiarity with your plans and my own experience, I shall expect the cables of this bridge to equal, if they do not excel, the best that ever were made. 